Um, so, uh, welcome to everybody and thank you, thank you all for coming to this month's um, second Migration Seminar. For those of you who are new, the Migration Seminar series is a monthly um, seminar in which we invite researchers and practitioners whose work addresses human mobility to share and discuss their work with us. The series is organized jointly by the Maastricht Graduate School of Governance, uh, slash UNU Merit, and Masamide. And today we are very lucky to welcome Dr. Valeria Bello. Um, Dr. Bello, who, who obtained her PhD in sociology and political sociology um, from the University of Florence, is the director of the official Master of Advanced Studies in International Affairs and an associate professor of sociology at the Blangevna Faculty of Communications and International Relations at the University of Ramon Lul, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, in Barcelona. Um, she is a member of the Scientific Council of the European International Studies Association, an expert consultant on inequalities, migration, and human and international security for a variety of international agencies and governments, including different UN agencies, regional organizations, national and local governments, and civil society associations. Um, Kindly be informed that the audio of this seminar will be recorded, the recording is now on, to allow us to share, um, share the presentation on, on our YouTube channel. So um, once you join the seminar, I think everybody is already with us and, and has their camera off, but um, your, your camera and mic are automatically turned off, but of course you have the option to switch them on if you, if you, if you wish to. Um, in order to participate in the in the seminar or ask a question later. So for a bit of housekeeping, um, the seminars are planned for one hour, of which around 40 minutes is set aside for the presentation and 20 minutes for questions and discussion um, with, with the audience. So if you have any clarification questions, uh, you're, you're free to ask them during the presentation, but please do save your more substantial questions and comments for after the presentation when we will have um, time for, for more of a discussion. Um, so Dr. Velo, I'm going to um, give you the floor now. Um, and, and, and as Soha mentioned, I will remind you at, at um, when you have 10 minutes and then five minutes left for the presentation. So please, please um, feel free to start when you're ready. Thank you so much, Talita, for your kind introduction. And thank you all for inviting me today to present uh, this recent work that uh, I've published uh, on the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. Indeed, I've uh, uh, had the privilege to work with the colleague Sarah Leonard um, uh, to collect uh, a series of uh, contributions uh, uh, that we uh, first presented at one of our conferences at the European International Studies Association. And uh, we um, then uh, created this special issue on the spiraling of the securitization of migration. So for me, it's a, a great pleasure to be here today and to be sharing with you uh, this research findings. I'll uh, try to summarize not only the findings in my uh, introductory work to the collection, but also the findings from uh, some of the most important findings from the other contributions. And I would uh, therefore very much like to thank the University of Maastricht and uh, my dear colleague, uh, uh, Melissa Siegel, who was a former uh, colleague of mine, fellow colleague of mine, when uh, I was also working at the United Nations University. So thank you so much also, Melissa, for thinking of me uh, and uh, uh, inviting me to uh, contribute to your seminar series. Thank you so much for that, very much appreciated. And it is always a pleasure to be among uh, our my previous fellow colleagues of the United Nations University. Um, so why um, uh, the spiraling of the securitization of migration? Um, I, uh, what I wanted to do is to uh, combine some of the research that I had uh, the privilege to investigate uh, through Marie Curie at the time, a Marie Curie grant uh, in, uh, I think it was around 2009 uh, when I got the grant to study in particular prejudice and how prejudice spread and what are the main uh, causes 
the main uh, elements that uh, influence the development of uh, uh, prejudicial attitudes towards others. And the most recent work that I had developed uh, on in a different field of study, the one of uh, the securitization of migration, so in intercultural, inter international uh, relation and particular international security. And I've combined these two fields uh, for what then has become this special issue that has been recently published in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. The, um, the reason for that was that I think obviously migration is uh, one of those fields of uh, research that is, uh, um, let's say, a natural port cross-border uh, area of study uh, for its very reason. When people uh, uh, migrate, uh, they uh, involve a series of uh, dynamics and mechanisms uh, that uh, connect both uh, social issues, uh, but also concerns in the political domain or the economic one. And uh, it also includes as uh, uh, many uh, highlight gender issues or uh, human security issues. So it seemed naturally to me to work interdisciplinary uh, to this topic. And in particular, I thought that prejudice was one of those elements that uh, uh, actually uh, played a role when it comes uh, to migration and to the governing, uh, to the governing of migration. But uh, in the field of security studies, I had noticed that it wasn't um, included in the framework to, uh, to explain uh, why we would engage with the, with the phenomenon of migration in certain ways rather than others. And therefore, I've had this idea to combine the two together, the prejudice and the securitization of migration. And what um, we claim in the special issue is that prejudice is uh, an element that self fulfills the um, securitization of migration and reinforces it. So what do we mean with the securitization of migration for those who do not study uh, international security? Uh, the securitization of migration is a branch of studies that uh, focuses in particular on the phenomenon of uh, uh, the creation of a migration crime nexus uh, that is particularly um, evident uh, from uh, the end of the Cold War. Why? Because some scholars have claimed that uh, at the end of the Cold War, the security professionals had to uh, reorient their market uh, of activity because, the, of course, they could no longer work in uh, the, uh, the, the, the field of uh, spionage and all uh, the, the elements uh, brought about by the Cold War. And therefore, they found in the field of migration, a profitable market. And what has happened with this change? That they brought this security mentality into the governance of migration. Of course, the, this kind of uh, understanding of uh, the securitization of migration uh, does not um, uh, wishes to pass the idea that before migration was dealt uh, in better ways, uh, there have always been um, prejudice, uh, prejudicial ideas around migration uh, in the field of sociology. Prejudice has started since uh, uh, the 50s uh, with works uh, uh, from, for example, uh, Adorno or Alport or Bloomer. They all have studied the phenomenon of prejudice itself. So the, the securitization of migration does not um, look at migration as a phenomenon that has become a negative phenomenon uh, because of uh, the security professionals and what Bigoku's, the governmentality of the Anis. But uh, it highlights that after the Cold War, uh, the, the way migration was uh, dealt with at government the level changed. So uh, I, I would like to clarify this because sometimes there is some confusions about this idea. Uh, 
Um, uh, the other important element that we have to clarify is the definition of prejudice itself, because perhaps uh, we uh, do not uh, uh, completely see the connection between the two until we um, clarify how, in how many different ways prejudice can be considered uh, theoretically. So, for example, in uh, let's say that around we have a, a definition that is um, very uh, widespread and well used. Uh, that came from the 80s, so from uh, Pettigrew, who has defined prejudice as uh, uh, an antipathy uh, accompanied by uh, a faulty assumption and a faulty generalization. Now, this kind of definition of prejudice makes us um, focus particularly on its individual aspect, which is also a stake. Of course, there are individual characteristics, personal characteristics that uh, would lead uh, some persons to be more prejudiced than others. Um, but Prejudice can also be considered as a larger phenomenon. The video um, uh, has uh, in early 2000, I think it was 2001 when he published um, a work in which he explained that actually prejudice not always uh, is a phenomenon that has to do with the interaction between two persons or two groups, an in-group and an out-group, but can also be um, a, a, a state uh, practice on how to uh, make use of certain stereotypes for political, economic or social reasons. So what I've um, decided to, uh, to do is to, co to combine a bit these two uh, definitions in order to understand the fact that both interpersonal activities, but also governmental activities can entail for the governance of migration. And so by combining the two, I've, had, um, uh, I've developed this definition of prejudice as a condition uh, that uh, uh, contributes to socially constructing uh, the phenomenon of migration in certain ways. In particular, if there are prejudicial conditions, then the way uh, it constructs um, they construct uh, migration is uh, by showing diversity as an outer threat, as a threat to a group. Now, this, of course, means that prejudice becomes, uh, uh, in this view, the main qualifier of uh, a perspective of an idea of the nation that is anchored, that is uh, tied to uh, the homogenization of a group, so that uh, the, the group uh, feel threatened each time that something that is does not correspond with those elements of uh, homogeneity uh, then um, uh, happen and therefore there is a consequent discrimination of precisely targeted groups now these groups can be when it comes to prejudice can be groups that are diverse for different reasons we sometimes um, refer to prejudice also to consider not only migrants but also um, minority groups who per perhaps have never migrated but they're still within the country but to focus spe specifically on the phenomenon of migration then we can consider prejudice as uh, this uh, uh, perspective according to which the core of the nation is threatened either culturally or socially or politically by the presence of migrants or persons who cross the border to find uh, um, uh, a dignified life somewhere else, um, so f far from their countries or lands of origins. Uh, now, the, the, by combining together prejudice with the securitization of migration, what I've uh, considered is that uh, in, the in the field of securitization of migration, scholars had 
uh, taken into account the way through which the securitization of migration happens. And therefore, as I was saying before, uh, the scholars have looked at how the, the, the phenomenon of migration and migrants themselves were constructed, socially constructed as threat for uh, the nation and uh, to be dealt with uh, within the security domain rather than the political or the socioeconomic uh, uh, domains. But uh, this has also um, happened according to different scholars of the securitization of migration through what they call the speech acts, which are acts that uh, construct uh, linguistically migration as a security threat and so there is this creation of uh, migration crime nexus. Now we can find the, uh, the, the literature in particular I'm referring to is the one by Buzan and Weber um, but also uh, there were more contribution later on already we're talking in the uh, around 2006 when Jeff Huismans has published uh, some works also on the securitization of migration, highlighting the fact that the securitization of migration had as a consequence the one uh, to skew the um, uh, the power uh, of the uh, so this to skew the decision making process in favor of uh, the executive power and at the expense of the. Uh, of the parliaments, of the role of the parliaments by creating the emergency, the idea of the emergency. So what we claim in the spiraling of the securitization of migration is that all this uh, uh, literature, what in the hand have led us to consider is that uh, migration is managed rather than governed and it is managed as a crisis. Now, the point is that this crisis do not happen in, uh, um, in a way that is uh, um, continuous, but they're scattered, inflamed reactions to specific uh, uh, security issues that are real security issues, such as war, conflicts, or other um, uh, instabilities that spread in other areas of the world and entail for those real security threats and real security reasons such as war and conflicts. Uh, they entail um, uh, flows of refugees or also of migrants who are looking for, uh, as I was saying before, a dignified life in other places. And what happens is that in the receiving countries, these uh, migration flows or refugees uh, flows as well are uh, lived as security threat for the reason I was explaining before. What happens is that the, the combination of our prejudice of perceiving the phenomenon negatively in, uh, in a generalized a stereotype way um, um, somehow hinders us from governing it uh, positively and uh, making the most out of it. Because uh, as we know, and I'm sure Melissa has uh, uh, very often published and uh, um, uh, talked about how migration indeed is uh, uh, an important uh, contribution to development, uh, both in uh, receiving countries and in countries of origin. But uh, uh, the point is that migration is perceived as a negative phenomenon. And therefore, we have this uh, uh, this management uh, of uh, human mobility as a threat and as uh, uh, something that needs to be limited or to be uh, dealt with as an emergency. With the, with the work that we have uh, uh, developed with the special issues, we therefore noticed that this becomes 
uh, a negative cycle that uh, revolves around itself and then uh, creates more prejudicial conditions and creates more challenges than opportunities for everybody, not only the migrants, but also the, the citizens of, us, of uh, receiving societies. And in particular, because uh, prejudice creates the securitization of migration. So if you would read the introduction to the special issue that I have uh, written, you would uh, see how uh, prejudice uh, is, is, the, is proved that once it's involved in non-state actors activities in managing um, uh, migratory uh, journeys or stays uh, in, uh, migrants stays in uh, countries of destination, then it entails the development of practices and narratives that securitize further migrants and so construct migrants as threat uh, increasingly over time. And therefore prejudice uh, self-fulfills itself and self and reinforces the, the process of the securitization of migration, creating this spiraling progression that makes it uh, even more a um, crisis to manage. And um, uh, we've seen that it, uh, in this way, it actually um, entails a series of uh, um, uh, challenges for all the, the, the states and uh, actors involved, included non-state actors and the migrants themselves and local populations. For example, some uh, contribution to the special issues have proved that, that uh, the, this uh, prejudicial idea of, uh, of migration uh, has uh, entailed for the European Union that uh, it could not successfully um, uh, negotiate with third countries, but actually uh, both Jordan, if you if you look at the, one of the contribution on EU-Jordan relations and another contribution on the EU-Balkans relations, both uh, countries in the Balkans and Jordan have actually uh, been successful at uh, leveraging their power in uh, the negotiation with the EU uh, by somehow weaponizing the, the, the presence of migrants. Uh, it, it, um, one example is how by um, stopping migration at the fence, you make, uh, you achieve to portray it as a, 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 a larger phenomenon than it is. Consider the difference of uh, having 200 thousand persons arriving and spreading around Europe or having them blocked at the fence at the border between the Balkan countries and the European Union. Of course, the image that would reach media and be spread from there uh, is completely different and makes the phenomenon uh, appear much uh, more uh, challenging than it is. Um, but other findings, for example, have uh, focused on the role that uh, uh, states uh, uh, department have had uh, both in, uh, uh, for example, with the securitization of uh, development uh, programs in the UK have been uh, uh, shifting their um, the um, approaches to development aid that before were connected, of course, to the um, to objectives of uh, uh, humanitarian nature, and instead uh, now become uh, connected to the need to uh, smooth some uh, challenges and some uh, security issues. Uh, so you see the logic is also changing behind those programs. Other examples that uh, we have within the special issues are uh, with the special issue um, at the contribution on uh, uh, the border uh, activities, the border control, and uh, Stefania Panepianco has uh, um, shown has uh, as the uh, those states that intervene at the borders have to um, somehow sort of 
um, find compromises between the humanitarian approach and the security approach and the control that is needed at the border. And this, of course, uh, entails uh, the, the uh, somehow uh, a series of puzzling questions about what is the true nature of some operations at the borders. Uh, and others have instead looked uh, at uh, uh, the role of uh, Frontex agency in uh, uh, security checks at the borders, particularly uh, the editor, the other editor of the special issue, Sarah Leonard, and uh, uh, together with uh, Christian Corner, they looked at the role of Frontex in uh, spiraling the securitization of migration. Uh, but in addition, and then uh, lastly, uh, we've also looked within the special issue at the role that uh, also objects now have in the spiraling, such as the drones that control the borders. And there is a fascinating um, contribution by Maria uh, Gabrielson Jumbert and uh, uh, Bruno Oliveira Martins on, uh, uh, on the drones uh, and how they also contribute to portraying in stereotyping ways um, migration. Of course, if those who create this, uh, uh, you know, this construct, this artificial constructs and objects to control migration have uh, prejudicial ideas. Those prejudicial ideas end up uh, uh, going into the programming of such objects and therefore you reproduce also automatically uh, through inanimated objects, the conditions that we have. Uh, about migration. And then uh, just to give some examples of how instead different conditions can bring about a more positive uh, uh, situation, there is one contribution by Katarina Krepatz who has uh, uh, instead considered the role of uh, civil society movements, particularly welcome movements across the borders of some countries in Europe, and how they could change the, uh, the, the, the perceptions that there were around migration in those areas. So this also shows how when you, instead of using the prejudicial condition, you use, you use positive ideas, then you contribute more positively to governing the phenomenon. And then the last contribution that closes the special issue is another of my, because I've written the, the, the introduction, but I've also written one contribution on uh, reception centers. So what I did, and I would like to spend the last uh, minutes uh, of this talk to show you the result of that, what I did is uh, a covert, covert uh, ethnographic investigation in reception center, in extraordinary reception centers in Italy. Um, I have to say that uh, it was uh, a, an extremely interesting research for the reasons that I think I, I've been the only researchers who, who, who could enter these places uh, without uh, um, uh, without the situation in which managers of, re of uh, um, extraordinary reception centers could arrange ways to uh, somehow hide certain dynamics because normally people, researchers have to inform before entering these centers and therefore managers tend to you know, uh, cover up for some things. And uh, so I did a covert investigation to avoid that. And it was extremely uh, interesting to see the extent that racism and prejudice uh, um, uh, can affect the extent to which uh, racism and prejudice can affect those places. And it became clear that when it exists, when prejudice is involved in the management of uh, uh, migration, that, in, that then it entails uh, um, uh, negative dynamics, practices and narratives that 
reproduce themselves. So, so for example, when managers of reception centers are prejudiced towards these persons, the, the behavior, the, the tensions increases, increase in these centers. And therefore, uh, migrants are also more hostile towards one another. They uh, have to solve their issues outside the center rather than inside the center. They cannot talk, they cannot mediate among each other because the managers would not allow them to do that. And therefore they took the fight, the, the, the situation, because this become real fights, they took them outside the reception centers because uh, there's no other way to solve those issues. And therefore then people who are living around there, when they see migrants uh, fighting or arguing uh, strongly outside the reception centers in the, in the towns, then they start to develop negative narratives around uh, how hostile or uh, uh, aggressive they are. And the fourth is then uh, spiral into um, the development of these meta narratives that they are violent and they threat, uh, they're a threat in the town. Therefore, it, it was extremely interesting then to compare this with another uh, reception, a extraordinary reception center where instead the managers were not prejudiced. So what happened is that in, uh, in this reception centers, migrants, even if they had, as it can happen when you live in 20 person in a house, if they could have uh, uh, some situations within the house, they would normally, um, uh, discuss about it within the center with the mediation of uh, uh, the managers who would ask them to solve those issues. And these persons then, uh, the migrants who lived in these different reception centers, when they would go outside, they would never have any uh, dangerous or violent situation. And therefore the local citizenship and I mean, we're talking about the same context, the two towns with very similar contexts, very close to each other, but the population would not perceive them as uh, threats. Even they would bring a presence uh, to those migrants who were having children uh, within the center. They were treating them in, in a more humane way. They would treat them as like everybody else. So prejudice was decreased. So this research was very interesting for me to show how how prejudice becomes a self-reinforcing mechanism that securitizes spiraling, spirals the securitization of migration and construct migrants as a threat increasingly over time. And instead, when there is, a, um, let's say, a more inclusive condition, the situations don't happen. And uh, we definitely have to take into account prejudice when we uh, deal with migration and if we want to govern the phenomenon positively rather than uh, managing the emergency around it, then we should definitely make sure that prejudice doesn't take place in any of the, 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 uh, the venues where migration is uh, dealt with. With this, I would conclude. I look forward to your questions. I know I've put many things into uh, 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, uh, and it's a lot. So I very much uh, would like to, uh, to, to listening to, uh, to your comments and respond to your question. Uh, thank you so much for your attention up to now. Dr. Vella, thank you so much for the, this fascinating introduction to the, the special issue that you've edited. I think we're all looking forward to reading it. Um, one of our students has already asked where, where we can access um, this work, which I, I think is already publicly available online. Yes, so. it's already published. It was published on the 20, I don't remember if the 18th or the 28th of December in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Study. The introduction is open access. Uh, and uh, but if you're interested in any of the other contribution, uh, the the I'm sure uh, the libraries uh, would uh, provide opportunities to access also those other contributions. And feel free to get in contact with me in case you have any other question.
Thank you. That's very generous. And and yes, I'm sure access to the, the rest of the the special issue won't be a problem for the for the students here at least. And great that the introduction is entirely open access too. Um, so this is the point at which we open up the floor to a more general discussion. I think Melissa already has a question that she wants to ask. If I, I see you have your yellow hand raised. Yeah, thanks. So I do have a question, but maybe um, uh, Valeria, if it's possible later, you could even put a link to the special issue in the chat, because I think a lot of people would love to go right there. So thanks so much for the talk. Um, of course, you gave us a lot of information and, and I was really interested in some more examples, actually. So, I mean, you gave examples in the reception center and things like that, but um, I'd love to see some really more practical examples of how prejudice um, is uh, creating the securitization of migration. So making kind of that direct link in a very clear case. And then um, I'm also quite interested in some examples of prejudice in securitization. So if you came across very specific examples, I just think this helps to also illustrate the points a lot more. Thanks. So I've just pasted the, the, the link to the special issue in the chat. Um, and from there, you can also then uh, see the related articles and uh, um, look for, for, for the other articles. It will appear in the, let's say, the, the hard copy of the special issue and the online special issue in its uh, entirety uh, next year, I guess in 2021. For now, they're open. Uh, they're uh, online first. So yeah, thank you so much, Melissa, for your question. Uh, well, it actually allows me to uh, to show to go more in depth in some of these contributions. Uh, I've already mentioned a bit uh, about my my research, but I want to show also uh, some of the other interesting works. Uh, for example, let's take the first article, the the one published by um, Peter Seger and Federica. Azardo, they looked at the um, negotiation between uh, Jordan and the European Union. And they realized that these negotiations, while at the beginning were very, uh, the, the European Union could very much uh, establish the rules, the criteria according to which uh, the Jordan uh, could um, apply uh, the, the, the package. Uh, um, and uh, the, the, the aid, they could, could spend the aid provided by the European Union. With, uh, with the refugee crisis, what has happened is that uh, the, the negotiation became more and more informal. And uh, why? Because the European Union didn't want uh, the, the, the refugees to reach the European uh, coast. So that, that was the prejudicial idea is that Jordan could, uh, let's say, um, seize to leverage its power. The same happened with the Balkans. I think it's uh, uh, Jonathan Webb who um, showed with the Balkans case, it happened pretty much the same. So the fact that the European Union was so scared by the arrival of these migrants uh, was used very cleverly by uh, some uh, Balkan states to stop them at the fences and show these pictures of this big crisis just at the uh, doors of Europe and therefore the European Union uh, could, uh, uh, I mean, agreed to uh, certain uh, elements, certain clauses that in the past they considered untouchable. So uh, this only to mention the, the, the level of uh, governance uh, at, uh, the, I mean, the regional level of governance, uh, but uh, there are more to, uh, for it, um, among the, the, the elements that I found uh, very interesting is the, uh, the, uh, the visual uh, prejudice that through our minds passes to the drones when it comes to uh, decide what is a threat at the border. And so there is a specific visualization of what is a threat at the border. And I think uh, that is uh, uh, an incredibly interesting uh, 
um, example of how prejudice then concretizes uh, through uh, even programming of objects such as the drones. And, um, uh, and I think the, uh, the, the work I've done in the, uh, in the, um, in the extraordinary reception centers uh, was indeed uh, what uh, uh, struck me the most. And uh, I think uh, that is where the idea came to my mind uh, to combine the securitization of migration with prejudice, because it was so evident, for example, the manager, uh, in, in, I've, I've told you already a bit, but the manager of one of the senders considered the migrants, uh, he, he openly said that uh, according to him, these were animals and were savages and yeah uh, not we're not talking about uh, uh, you know forms of uh, uh, let's say hidden forms of prejudice but blatant racism and uh, important forms of prejudice in dealing with them so he would say well they cannot speak in the house and they cannot have because you know as soon as you uh, allow them to speak then uh, uh, they would uh, uh, go at each other's throat and uh, uh, just like animals and they would be violent and you know you would realize by looking at a different place how actually who was creating those tensions and uh, those very aggressive behaviors was the management of the place itself rather than the persons. Because uh, then the persons uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, in other reception centers wouldn't behave like that for the simple reason that they could, uh, they didn't have to uh, take so many uh, aggressions, physical and verbal aggressions. Of course, if you, the constant target of physical and uh, verbal aggression within a reception center, then you develop uh, as a, a reaction for the post-traumatic stress disorder, you would develop uh, um, some uh, uh, aggressive behaviors. And therefore then, if you're not allowed to solve those aggressive behaviors within uh, the senders with the help of specialized doctors, which these persons were um, uh, could not uh, uh, enjoy because uh, the, the managers imagine if he considered them uh, um, as uh, mm -hmm. subhumans, then he would not provide health in terms of uh, uh, doctors or specialists to them. And therefore, they would bring all these tensions outside the senders and having real fights sometimes, but it, it was clearly a consequence of a bad management because a very few kilometers from there in a different reception center with different managers, none of uh, the uh, of the migrants or refugees who were there uh, had similar situations were involved in criminal activities or uh, in violence. Of course, they would have sometimes still some arguments, but dealt with within the senders with the help of uh, and the intermediation of managers and everything was solved smoothly. The point is that sometimes these migrants also suffer post-traumatic stress disorder because of the very dangerous uh, uh, journeys that they undertake to reach Europe. So they also need the help of uh, uh, specialized uh, doctors, uh, and we know this for several reports that have been in other field of migration studies that relate migration and health issues. So I think this uh, uh, some examples of how prejudice has affected uh, uh, the securitization of migration, uh, but um, you can find it in several other contributions uh, within the special issue you, if you uh, I don't want to spend too much time because you know, Melissa, when I start speaking, then I don't stop. So please feel free to stop me when I, uh, when I'm, uh, when I'm speaking too much. Okay, <laughs> don't worry. But uh, you'll find many, many of these examples, many more examples in the other contributions. Yeah. No, thank you. I think the the you know real world examples are really helpful in in this case. Thanks.
Thanks so much. So Valeria, I know that we have another question um, from Kevin. I don't know whether you want to address each question as we go along, or of course, if you prefer, you can gather questions um, in, in groups and then answer them together. Equally to our audience members, I should say that you're welcome to use the chat if you want to pose your questions or simply to raise your hand, um, turn on your mics, videos, whatever you prefer. But um, I'll, I'll let Kevin um, ask his question now. Uh, well, first off, thank you so much for your presentation. I found it uh, very interesting and thank you for joining us today. I was interested when you were describing your own contribution to the special issue, um, when you talked about the methodology, um, correct me if I misheard, but I think you said that your position was in a more covert nature. And I was wondering exactly what that meant and what you expected from um, the results due to your covert nature as opposed to a more open stance. Talita, I still prefer, do you want to collect more questions or should I reply? Well, thanks. Well, thank you so much, Kevin, for the question. It's actually very interesting. It was very puzzling for me also at the beginning. I had to go through an ethical review for this because, of course, uh, um, uh, it entailed ethical issues as well as, well as security issues. Um, because these senders are not normal senders, normal reception senders, but they are extraordinary reception senders. So they, um, the process through which managers are appointed is different from uh, the one of regular reception senders. But the reason for which I was so interested in them is that, and you can read this in another contribution that has been published in January 2021 in international politics, is uh, that in Italy there has been a, a normalization of the exception. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, these were extraordinary reception senders because they had to be uh, used only in case of peaks in arrival. But then they became the normality, the normal in, uh, in Italy. And uh, more than 80% of the migrants and refugees that were arriving to Italy were hosted in this uh, extraordinary reception centers. So, so I said, well, we need to do some investigations in these centers. But the problem is that you don't, that you don't get access to them. So I knew some because uh, the place, uh, I can't mention where is the place uh, because of the, those covert reasons, uh, but uh, I had ways to enter this, uh, uh, some of these reception centers for uh, the, some conducts I had. But uh, the only way was to do a covert investigation. So I had to go through an ethical review uh, and uh, a security review because, of course, I can't disclose uh, the name of the senders for uh, also for security reasons for the persons, both the migrants who were involved and my family, uh, because there could be repercussions, let's say, uh, in um, uh, if it is revealed the the the. The place, the name of the places where I've been, but the places were two reception centers, uh, which were uh, in two towns in the same valley. The two towns are very similar, and the the uh, the, the number of persons, the let's say all the contextual factors, economic, social, and cultural factors were the same. So the only difference uh, that there was lied in the different managers, okay? So the two senders had exactly the same structure, up to uh, 20 persons could host, and the only difference were the managers. And the managers, in one case, were prejudicial, strongly racist, I would say, um, and in the other case, they were not. And the difference were absolutely incredible. But uh, it entailed, of course, uh, security concerns and ethical concerns. So I, of course, all the data were anonymized and the um, I had to make sure that uh, uh, both the safety of uh, persons host there and other persons involved in the research uh, would be uh, always uh, guaranteed. And also the anonymity for the managers themselves, because of course I cannot reveal the names, uh, but what I think is that what 
the most important element that I've learned from this research is that there should be a rule to uh, control for the acti attitudes of managers in these reception centers. Now the point, and it is the reason for which then I've published the other research in 2021 in international politics on the normalizing the exception, is that I've realized that there is that law in Italy. But what has happened? So there is a law for which managers of reception center cannot be uh, racist or prejudiced. There is an anti-discriminatory anti law that is applied in the Napolitano Turco law of uh, immigrant reception in Italy. But the point is that with a series of security decrees uh, made uh, upon a request of uh, dealing with the emergency, so these are regulatory frameworks that are exceptional, taken with the executive power. Um, with this uh, security decrees, uh, the, the governments were able to bypass the anti-discriminatory law that is included in the migration law Turco Napolitano. So if you read the other article, it, it explains this part of the research, let's say. And it's very interesting because it reminds us of what uh, Giorgio Agamben, I don't know if you've uh, uh, had the opportunity to read Giorgio Agamben, who is an Italian philosopher who's wrote The State of Exception that was initially, uh, it was initially apply to the case of Guantanamo. Well, the state of exception explains very well the normalization of the exception in Italian reception centers uh, through this other contribution. But thank you so much, Kevin, for your question that allowed me to go in depth and also bridge with the other research. Thank, uh, thank you. you so much as well. I, I love that connection with the state of exception as well. I think that that gives me a lot of context. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for your question. Thanks, but so I'm sure there are many other questions um, that that we would like to ask. There's probably only time for one or two very brief questions. Um, there is already a, a question posed in the chat, um, which asks, you mentioned several times the difference between managing and governing migration. Could you explain where exactly you see the differences between the two? Excellent, because it's connected with what I've just said about the state of exception. So the, the point is, if you want to govern migration, you need to use some uh, law instruments that pass through the uh, pass through the parliaments, and so they do not skew the decision making towards the executive power. We, in this sense, um, I would like to remind what I said before about Huismans and uh, the idea that the securitization of migration skews the um, the uh, the the power towards the executive at the expense of the parliament. So what happens is that uh, with the creation of the emergency, governments have, uh, have, governments have to uh, somehow deal with the emergency. Because they have to deal with the emergency, they can use uh, these uh, regulatory instruments such as uh, decrees uh, that allow you to bypass some laws because of uh, the existence of a specific emergency situation. This is what also George Argerman talks about when he says the state of exception. The state of exception exists because we can um, go, we can uh, uh, execute some, uh, we can apply some uh, uh, executive decisions. Uh, because there is an emergency. And so we bypass the parliament and uh, we make a decree. Now, the, this is what happens with uh, the securitization of migration. And therefore, uh, if you see in the Italian, I can make you the example of the Italian case because I know it very well, but I'm sure you can say this also in other cases because uh, Mark Salter uh, has published the research on the uh, US uh, uh, normalization of the exception in the migration field in 2008. I, I don't remember 
the journal in which he published it, but it's by Mark Salter and uh, is uh, an article of 2008. Now, I've seen it also in Italy with this uh, contribution that I've published uh, just now in January 2021 in International Politics. What you would see is that we do not govern the phenomenon before. We do not govern it with a law that establishes what are the criteria to uh, positively um, uh, uh, to positively govern the phenomenon and to consider the different aspects, the overlaps between different domains, the economic domain, the social domain, uh, the cultural domain. We can't do that. Why? Because everything is framed in, the, in terms of uh, emergency and exceptionality and therefore governs, governments uh, um, uh, publish uh, and take these decisions uh, through um, through decrees, through exceptional laws that use the clause of exception in order to bypass all the other anti-discriminatory laws and uh, bypass uh, all the possible obstacles that they would find in the parliament. And therefore, with the decrees, they manage migration as an emergency constantly. But this management of migration as an emergency then spirals into a securitization of migration that creates more and more connections between migration and crime, migration and violence, and therefore it increases prejudicial narratives, prejudicial practices, and it is a spiral that goes on and on and makes it uh, a phenomenon that uh, revolves around itself uh, without uh, uh, allowing us to uh, benefit from the opportunities and innovation that migration is uh, very famous in all economic studies to entail. So I hope I've uh, replied to the question because I know we had very few minutes for that reply, but uh, uh, you can read more in the contributions that I've mentioned. Thank you for the very interesting question to Eleanor Carl. Um, well, yeah, it's a shame that we don't have any more time for any more questions, but we should take this opportunity to end perfectly on time. Thank you for that. Um, um, Dr. Bello, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing uh, with us your, your work and your thinking on this. Um, and thank you everybody else who was able to attend today. Um, and we look forward to, to welcoming, you, welcoming you all to the next Migration Seminar. I'll turn thank you so much for inviting me. It was great to be here and sharing my ideas with you. Goodbye and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Melissa.